there were no chiefs in this tribe until people started come visiting them. And then Westerners brought things for them, gifts, whatever, resources, arrowheads. And they had to figure out who's going to communicate with these people, who's going to divvy up these resources, who's going to do all this stuff. Used to be egalitarian, now have to have a chief structure because you'll get it. I'm Anthony Gustin, and this is the Lifestylist Podcast. Brothers and sisters, misses and misters, what's happening? This is the 374th episode of the Lifestylist Podcast. It's called The Wildlife of the Last Hunter Gatherers and the Truth About Keto with Dr. Anthony Gustin. This here episode is made possible from our friends over at onit.com slash Luke. You can grab yourself some alpha brain, turn that brain on over there. And we've got waterandwellness.com slash story for all things water purification, etc. And finally, blueblocks.com slash lifestylist to get that blue light out of your life. Our guest, Anthony Gustin, is the founder and CEO of Perfect Keto and Equip Foods. He's also host of the Natural State podcast and author of the best-selling book, Keto Answers. He's a former sports rehab clinician turned entrepreneur. He's trained in functional medicine and has ordered labs and set treatment plans for hundreds of patients. So it sounds like he knows a thing or two, and we're going to find out all about it. Now, this episode was intended to be an exploration into all things keto with Anthony and his company, Perfect Keto, being some of the first on the scene to promote it and provide information about these diet choices. However, as the conversation took shape, it kind of found its way into exploring his recent trip to Tanzania to spend time with the Hadza tribe, one of the last fully intact hunter-gatherer tribes in the world. And there was just so much wisdom to be gained from this experience that he shares from the way they eat, live, and most of all, the way they relate to one another and their very spiritual relationship with the land and nature in general. So I'll leave it up to you to further discover this incredible story of humanity and uh, how far we've drifted from our innate life way as a species. So this is a truly fascinating topic and one that came as a wonderful surprise to me as we began to record. I mean, I was all set. I'm going to like, do the keto show. I've never done one of those, uh, but you know, it quickly was revealed that there was much more that our guest had to offer. Now, the topics covered were vast. I'm going to give you a teaser here of the few things that we talked about, such as Anthony's experience eating baboon brains with our former guest, Dr. Paul Saladino, why Tanzanians are so much happier than Westerners, the incredible diversity of their diets, the importance of dance, music, and celebration in their lives how they raise children in a communal fashion, the rarely talked about importance of aligning our diets with the seasons, the importance of preserving hunter-gatherer tribes and their lands and how to best support them. And then we do finally get into some key points on ketosis, keto, et cetera, and dispel some of the commonly held myths around how and why to do it, or sometimes not. And finally, we talk about some of the best foods and supplements to support a keto diet. And if by the end of the episode, you'd like to check out some great keto products, you can do so by visiting perfectketo.com. And uh, these guys were kind enough to give you a discount of 20%, pretty hefty. And that discount code is the lifestylist20. So that's perfectketo.com. I love their stuff. Now, I've never been great at just being keto. I, I mean, I don't even know if it's something I would want to do. I have gone through phases where I try. <laughs> it's very difficult, but it is helpful if you're able to take ketones and things like that uh, to help curb those cravings and you know all the thing, which you're going to learn about shortly. Okay, that's it, my friends. Let's jump right into this inspiring conversation with Dr. Anthony Gustin. And may this episode inspire you to get outside and connect with your environment, because remember, you are the environment. Enjoy the show. Man, good to see you again. Last time I saw you, we were uh, in a really interesting situation. We were out with the force of nature folks, mm -hmm. uh, witnessing and somewhat participating in the field harvest of a massive bison. It's pretty intense, huh? Oh my God, that was wild. Are you I, a hunter at all? Do you? Well, I recently, it's fun, actually today, a podcast came out with uh, Monsal Denton, a friend of mine who has a company called Sacred Hunting. I don't know if you know Monsal, but he created a platform to bring men out into the wilderness and as a rite of passage, give them a sacred experience of hunting. 
So that was my first hunting trip out here in Texas. So you went with one of his sacred hunting crews. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, how was the experience? Oh, dude, <laughs> it was heavy. It was heavy. It was wild because I, I hunted a little bit when I was a kid, but then you know later in life became a vegetarian and was very not hunter like. Um, and in that experience, you also uh, one of the days have a psilocybin ceremony, kind of in mid hunt over the weekend, but now. Not while you're <laughs> no, right. no, <laughs> no, but pretty close after and before. Uh, no, it's very safe, but it was incredible for me because I shot a wild boar the first night just right out of the gate, uh, which was an incredibly moving experience in so many ways. And I won't go into the details because, as I said, there's a whole podcast about it that came out today. But the following day is when we did the journey. And so I really got to process a lot of that experience. Uh, in a very visceral way, mm -hmm. you know, just dealing with death and guilt and karma and all of those big topics when it comes to uh, a lost natural human life way. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was powerful. So when we went and uh, participated in the field harvest with force of nature, um, I keep saying harvest, there's a T on the end, harvest. <laughs> Uh, I was already, already in the, in the, in the zone of that, you know, it's like, mm. it was only probably three weeks after the hunt. So I was familiar with that palpable experience of life energy moving in and out of something. But that was heavy because of the magnitude mm. and power of that creature. And you were there. I mean, what it did after it was dead, like the body still undulating and kicking and kind of running in in the air on the mm -hmm. ground and all that i mean it was whew, that was powerful medicine and then we ate some of it yeah right away raw heart organs, yeah raw liver did you have any of the the bile, bile on the liver? <laughs> yeah you? yeah that was uh, that was intense kind of old comanche yeah a pre-battle tasted like acid reflux yeah yeah, that was wild. I mean, I diesel was, fuel is like the closest it, I could get. It to wasn't it. entirely unpleasant, but it was, it was powerful medicine. I mean, the life force in that, in those organs, that fresh. I mean, the heart was warm still. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just incredible experience. So yeah, but I'm glad we got to connect because we've been talking about doing this interview. I want to say for like five years, <laughs> like it's been kind of on the like books that. and. I want you to come out to LA and you live somewhere else. And then, you know, we just didn't get it done. So here we are. Um, I want to start, you know, there's a bunch of things I have in my notes. I know your, your area of expertise is very broad and there's a million directions we could go. You've been historically one of the uh, voices of the keto movement. I know there's much more to you than that. And I definitely want to touch on some of that stuff, but I'm currently, especially in light of the experience we shared and my recent hunting experience, I want to hear about the trip to Tanzania with Paul Saladino. Yeah. So the keto stuff, which we'll get to, of course, is just a curiosity of mine that come up that had come up uh, in my research of figuring out how to help people not be sick. And then I just have been asking myself this question for in the last 15, 20 years. Why are people sick and how do you get them well when they are sick? And so going to visit the Hazza tribe in Africa was sort of this the culmination of all of this lifelong journey of trying to figure out like, why are people sick and going to where humans have evolved from, you know, we're thought to 200 plus thousand years ago, a couple million years ago, bipedal uh, creatures walking around was extremely powerful. And it's one of these things where you read a lot and you can maybe understand something or learn it. But you don't actually know it until you experience it. This is kind of the, the, the trip that we had. It was, it was intense. So, we were originally going to go with one of our friends to do a documentary. Um, so my friend Brian Sanders has a thing called Food Lies. He's making a documentary. So he's going to go there. Paul asked me to go with us. said, absolutely. This is like a once in a lifetime trip. Him and I actually ended up going a week early. And man, it was, uh, yeah, it was, this, again, like I've read about these people, but to, to spend time with them and soak it all in, many, many years of research in just what makes humans healthy and what do we need beyond nutrition, community, relationship, religion, parenting, all this stuff, work, quality of life, uh, connection with nature, hunting, things like this. All of this was just integrated in a week. It was insane. So we started off by going to two game reserves 
And this is really fascinating because these this is where the Hadza tribe should be. So they are currently in a small area south of Lake Yasi. And this is an area that the government has basically pushed them to. And they have no other place to go. And they're surrounded by a bunch of other tribes that are more farmers now. So they have cornfields, onion fields, cattle, goats, etc. And so no large game can get to them. And so seeing the game reserves, one of these places is called Ngoro Ngoro Crater, it was more wild than the Lion King. Look around any direction, and there were thousands of animals of any species you could imagine. There were lions just lying next to antelopes. And there were wildebeests and hyenas next to uh, flamingos. Like Everything was just coexisting in such harmony. And it was just so clear being there, like, oh, humans should have been here as well. Like, we, are, we were taken out, separated from nature. My philosophy on health is just like all of the health problems we have are division from nature. So when the human organism leaves nature, we get sick mentally and physically. And it was just so clear about how much abundance there was for animals that ate plants and animals that ate other animals. It, it, this is like a cornucopia of life. And then to see the, the transposition of how their life has changed, they have remained you know, very much hunter-gatherer tribes. They're one of, I think, only five or seven left in the entire world. And so it was still very illuminating, but also startling to see what happens when they are removed from that subset. Like their frame is tiny and they're, they're very, very small people. And they have to hike now 20 miles. Like our first hunt, we hiked 20 miles out to get a baboon. I posted this on my Instagram. People freaked out. You're killing monkeys, you savages. What's going on? It's like, these people don't have access to a grocery store. They used to be able to go out a kilometer and kill a giant eland, which is a large antelope type of thing. Uh, now they have to hike 20 miles to see where the baboons are to kill them to feed 40 plus people. And so they're having to start to subsist on ugali, which is this cornmeal. And so their their way of life is already changing. And I think they're going to be extinct within the next you know, 20, 40 years. I don't think they're going to last beyond this generation, unfortunately. Uh, the tourism part is fascinating because it allows them to retain their their position in South Lake Yasi. Because the government goes, oh, people actually want to pay to see these people. Therefore, we're going to protect this a little bit, but they don't really do anything about it. So it was just crazy to see all this wisdom on the precipice of disappearing entirely. And that wow. was, it was heartbreaking. And they, they clearly don't know the gravity of the situation. And very few of them have left their actual tribe. A couple of them have lived with missionaries and then opted to come back. They didn't want to have any more of a modern life, but anywhere around that area, you have to drive six hours to the nearest village. So the exposure that they're going to get to any sort of modern or Western life is, is nil. It just doesn't happen. So they, they have no idea sort of like how we live, how sick people are, again, both physically and mentally. And it's just, it, yeah, it's, it's heartbreaking for sure. But so grateful to have the experience of soaking up as much of the wisdom as I could. That's so uh, incredible. And I definitely share the point of view that what ails us as a species is so simple. <laughs> it's just yeah. what you, it's the isolation from nature. And when you look at animals left alone in the wild, for the most part, they thrive until we take them and put them in a zoo. Right. And we give them kibble, which is like our version of a grocery store and unnatural lighting, the inability to move, the inability to commune with one another in, in community, however that looks for each animal. And now you see why you don't need huge hospitals out in the wild for all the, the sick animals, right? Mm -hmm. You only need vets for the animals that are domesticated or animals in the zoo. And it's just so plain for me to see, but I think we just get myopic as a species, right? We just get involved in our life. I got my iPad, I got the grocery store and my blue light at night to illuminate inside like it's the middle of the day and EMF connecting me to all of the things I want to be connected to. And um, I know that for me, anytime I just leave a city and get like really outdoors, not going to the park, but like get out, get out, my nervous system just goes, thank you. <laughs> We're okay. Right. It's just incredible. So I really, I listened to the podcast you did on Paul's show about that. And I was like, oh my God, what an incredible experience. Cause me, I just sit back and kind of theorize on what mm -hmm. a natural native 
people's day looks like and how they interact, you know, with each other emotionally, how they interact with the environment. But it's like hard to even imagine that that still exists because we're so far removed from it. Yeah. It's and, crazy. And I think that we see animals in a zoo and we know that they're sick, but somehow don't pl- apply that same perspective to us. I mean, we are pretty much literally in a zoo cage right now if you look around in the room. Yeah. And that's we, just... we have windows at least, <laughs> not bars, but yeah. Right. Very similar though. And I think that people have a tough time thinking that things have ever been different or will ever be different. And so they're born into a life and they just accept that that's the reality. And that's the way it's always been. And that's the way it will always, always will be. And that kind of drives just a lot of the confusion, I think, around health. And I mean, this is the chronic disease, for example, diabetes, heart disease, neurogenic disease, um, cancer, all these things didn't exist 150 years ago at all. It's not like it was something that just traditional people had. In the Western world, 150 years ago, this, this did not exist. None of these conditions existed. And when I have theories, Paul has a lot of theories around why this is the case, and we bring them up, mainstream medical professionals come after us. Like, oh, you guys figured out some solution. It's like, show me a better uh, just root cause problem of why this is the case instead of just accepting that everybody is sick and it will always be sick and this is a normal part of our species. It's not. Like the top seven ways we die as humans are not normal as of the last 150 years. This isn't like a couple thousand year old thing. And so to, to see these people in this place, robust health with no sort of intervention, like it, you can't really go anywhere in the world now that it's been 150 years. These things, which we can get into like why I think that's the case, but it's a, this type of lifestyle, you, you can't escape. You can't go observe these, these people, any, any people in a traditional human species sort of environment, unless you go to the middle of Tanzania and interact with these people. So that's what we did. And it was, again, just remarkable. Let's take a pause. I want to share something with you. You know, those times that you're so into what you're doing, you can't think about anything else. The days you read half a dozen chapters, write a thousand words or finish a work assignment without looking up once. And then finally, when you do, you notice it's dark outside. Well, how'd you like to feel like that every day? I'm here to tell you, you can. It's totally possible. Psychologists call that feeling of being in the zone, a flow state, the optimal level of consciousness where you can perform at your best. Our sponsor, Alpha Brain, helps you to achieve flow state and supports other aspects of cognitive function for better memory, focus, and mental processing. Alpha Brain can help you remember names and places, focus on complex tasks, think more clearly under stress, and even react more quickly. And this has all been documented. With its trademark earth-based ingredient blends, Alpha Brain builds an environment in which the brain can operate on all cylinders and protects its functioning for lasting mental clarity. If you're ready to have a brain that works, turn that thing on. Go over to onnit.com slash Luke. That's O-N-N-I-T.com slash Luke. And use the code Luke at checkout for 10% off. Get yourself into a flow state over at onnit.com slash Luke. What's different not only about their physical health and vitality, living off the land and just having, I mean, obviously they're eating seasonally and they're not eating anything processed and they're, I'm I'm assuming, finding some way to drink relatively clean water. No. So they're physical, they're drinking dirty water. So here's this giant misconception. So if you read any research about these people, they say, it's, okay, they have the best microbiome of any human ever studied. Then some random paper said it's because they eat 150 grams plus of fiber a day. Therefore, fiber leads to good gut health. So a lot of our recommendations are actually pulled from research that has no backing to it. So if you go, we saw these people, they eat maximum two grams of fiber a day. Maximum. What we did asked, they do? Did they just chew on tubers? And yeah. So, like... chew, so we actually dug up some tubers with them and watched them eat them. They either take the skin off, chew them and spit them out or boil them in a pot and throw out the actual fibrous parts. And so the fiber comes from, they have a, co- a couple of fruits. One's called baobab, which is like this dry, really soluble fiber. So maybe like, again, two grams a day they're getting. They're not eating fiber. This whole thing that hunter-gatherer tribes, at least this one specifically, ate a variety of fiber and that's what leads leads to their good gut health is insane. But you know what we did when we had the tubers is we our hands were full of dirt. Literally, we're digging into the earth to get them, and then we ate with our mouth, and then we never washed our hands, and we were butchering animals that were sitting out for eight hours. 
and then not washing your hands and eating with your hands. <laughs> and they're drinking, they dig into these riv- like these valleys that used to be riverbeds. They dig in and dirty water fills it. And then they drink that. Really? Yeah, I had a, wow. so I ate too many berries, almost died. It's an interesting story for you. We can get into that, but my stomach started to turn. It's getting really sick from this, this berry poisoning. And they dug up these tiny little roots and said, hey, chew on these roots. You go, I looked at the roots. It was like mostly dirt. It was a big clump of dirt. I was like, oh, the, <laughs> the medicine here is the, probably the dirt. It's the exposure, like their microbiome, they're like living in the dirt all the time, never washing their hands. It's the exact opposite of what we have now. And so their microbiome uh-huh. that we've studied is not because of fiber. They don't eat any fiber. They eat zero fiber. But they're always interacting with dirty and unclean things. Wow. So they're, they're inherently terrain theorists <laughs> by lifestyle design, right? Yeah. I mean, if they're living largely free of the diseases that we suffer from, and of course, as you know, a lot of that has to do with the health of the microbiome and hence the immune system, et cetera. So they're getting all these microorganisms then from basically eating dirty plant matter and they're getting some bacteria from the animals that they're processing mm-hmm. and things like that. And yeah. that's fortifying the biodiversity of the gut biome. Yeah. And we would have gotten deathly ill if we would have shrank the water, for example. Ah, okay. And this is just the reality of it. Like our immune systems are rather weak. Wow. Any other tune? I mean, this is where people go to Mexico and they drink the water and they get really sick. Mexicans can drink the water in Mexico and don't get sick. Why do you think that is? Oh, you know, right. Been Same with to, India yeah. too. Same thing. Wow. And so again, yeah, like I think like there's so many different ways to look at visiting them and how many factors contribute to health. I think there's like some sort of prioritization I have in my mind of like what are the most important things when it comes to health that can that people can change to make a positive impact in their life. It's so hard to to pull that apart after you get to the top couple. And I think that I mean it's like they're in the sun all the time. They don't wear sunscreen, obviously. It's like clear. Um they're their microbiome is so robust because they're living in dirt and eating dirt all the time. Like they don't eat anything processed, obviously besides the cornmeal, which even with that, totally fine, which drives a lot of my theories around the major things that cause some of these top health conditions. Their community is like, they're, they're never stressed. They're never, ever stressed. Like these are the happiest people I've ever seen in my life. There was 30 seconds of stress I saw over the entire trip. It was right before we killed the baboon, which Paul and I were actually like right there participating it was, it was one of the crazy experiences in my life. Um, so there's absolutely no stress. There's a lot of natural fasting. Uh, the relationships, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I could go on forever, but like all of these things that I've already thought, like that we have to work so hard for in a Western culture. Now all those little, little biohacks and tips and tricks and influencers are specialized and sleep or this or that. When you live in nature, you don't have to think about any of these things. They just happen. The massive amount of abundance they live in there was these times where we would just go walk out, you know, 30 meters outside of their camp. I'm like, hey, we're we're all these baobab for? I'm like, oh yeah, we can eat those. You want to try them? And they haven't eaten for two days. And we throw a stick up, they fall and crack them open. And Paul and I are like ravenously eating them because we haven't eaten in like six hours. And then they like slowly pass them around and eat them. And there's no scarcity of hoarding things. Baobab just stays in the tree till they, till they want it. There is, even when they're hungry and they kill an animal, everything is, the, the person who kills the animal goes around and gives a slice to everybody and everybody waits their turn. It's like everybody rushes in and tries to grab a leg and eat it. And there were so many of these examples where they could have a knife. We wanted to make poison for arrows. And this one guy could make 15 tools with the, the materials around him at any given time, just in five seconds. It was insane. Wow. He would just grab his little machete thing, cut, cut, cut. And... Here we have four different tools. And then he like made a tree stump into a cauldron and mixed everything in there. It was like the most crazy thing ever, like MacGyver style. And if you watch the show and you're yeah, angry, yeah, yeah. It's like to see that, like the resourcefulness and just the abundance mindset probably like lets them actually relax. And I thought a lot about this in our world of everything that we actually need to survive and that we need in life is so abstracted. And so everything kind of gets veiled between like you and money. So, oh, I go make money. I have to do this thing to make money to go buy food and shelter and all this other stuff. Nobody knows how to, like, if, you, if I were to put you out here, especially the trip before Monzo, like, how would you get food? How would you build a shelter? No one has these skills anymore. That's why I love what Monzo is doing. 
to reconnecting people to that. I'm moving out to a farm soon because I I, I just went on that strip. I'm like, oh, I have to I have to participate more and understand this stuff. And it's not like I'm being a prepper, but I think having some skills gives you confidence to actually live in a world in abundance of, oh, if something went crazy, I could find my own food. I could grow my own food and I could count on myself. Like we have communities now where people are just friends. But they're not providing for each other. And this is another thing that's like, it's, it's hard to trust people when your lives don't depend on it. And when, you know, the hunter who does this thing and the person who boils the root over here does that. And this lady makes clothes and like everybody has to work together because otherwise they would all die. And so it's a very different dynamic with the, with the relationship, especially with the men and the women. So this is something that people were very surprised about, myself included, that the men and the women were entirely separate. Almost like 95 plus percent of the time. Wow, really? Yeah. And the women had their own fire. The men had their own fire. And they basically didn't even talk to each other throughout the day. The, the women had a group. The men had a group. They had their own tasks. They were very, very split. So clear gender roles. Talked to them both individually about this. And they both said almost the exact same thing. Oh, with without the women and what they do, we wouldn't be here, we'd be dead. And the same thing, oh, without the men and what they do, we would be dead. And then within those circles, everybody sort of had their own role as well. So the men, each one of them sort of had a, a role to play and was respected by everybody else. Same with the women. And, you know, it's, it's interesting that we have these groups. I don't know what your community is like exactly. I mean, we sort of run in the same circles, but it's, we don't have this dependency on each other anymore. And I think that stripping that away might be another cause to just like want to always meet more people and do more things and like have this sort of novelty effect around always searching for more and bigger in relationships and communities. You know, the divorce rates, like you, can, you don't even need to have monogamous relationships working anymore. Like there's no dependency there. We've erased all gender roles and everybody's expected to do everything and you outsource all the important tasks. Baby goes away soon. And like food goes over here and like, We'll just all go make, each of us will go away from each other during the day, make money, and then come back and then use that money to buy all the things we actually need. It's just, it's just a strange thing. Wow. Like, what, what a, it, wow. The it, trip. Yeah. With the men and women being largely separated, and I, you know, I've never seen that, I don't think to that degree, but many years ago, I went to uh, Southern India for about a month, like on a spiritual pilgrimage. And I was in a lot of very rural areas and, and I noticed that same phenomenon. They're just in the streets of these little villages. You wouldn't see like commingling of the genders. You'd mm -hmm. see like a group of guys hanging out and you see a group of women. If there were people working in the fields, there'd be like a bunch of women working in this field, a bunch of men working in this field. It was the first time I'd ever seen that. And I, I didn't know what to make of it, but it was noticeable to the point where I thought, huh, that's really interesting. And I also noticed, and maybe there's some parallels here, I also noticed that you saw um, men being much more affectionate, like mm -hmm. much more touchy with each other, like grown men holding hands. And at first I thought, wow, they're really open with uh, homosexuality here. <laughs> the first couple of days I was like, wow, I didn't, I know there were so many gay Indians. But mm -hmm. then I started to realize it's like a dad with his teenage boy holding hands. And there was just much more kind of like, I don't know, just physical touch amongst people, especially amongst men which in the West, um, I think we have an unhealthy lack of that, right? I know mm -hmm. that I, I certainly did in my life. Um, so I noticed that there. What did you notice in terms of when the men and women would converge together? Um, what were you seeing in terms of human connection and hugging and affection and kissing and that kind of physicality? Not much. Really? Not much, but they also did sleep together. And so it was like at nighttime, we stayed at a camp a couple miles away. We actually weren't allowed to stay there anymore because of COVID. Which doesn't make any sense to me. We were with them an the entire day, but couldn't stay there. It's just weird. Well, you know, at night is when it really gets dangerous. <laughs> exactly. Um, so we didn't see exactly like when we left, but it was like everybody was going to bed every night when we left. But yeah, then then is when they would come together. And especially if there's like more of a newborn, there'd be more times where the parents would come together. Where and the interesting thing about the newborns is, and even the kids at large, is you wouldn't know who the parents were unless they were breastfeeding, basically. Or when the parents came together to grab the kid to go do something else. But it was very much so a communal style of upbringing kids. And there, yeah, there were just, there, I, didn't, I didn't see a lot of this sort of like hugging, embracing, et cetera. And maybe that happened behind closed doors. Maybe it's a cultural thing that they developed to like not show that or whatever. And I'm not saying these people are perfect and we should emulate their lives 100%. Um, but there is a lot to learn for sure. 
And with the uh, offspring, you got the sense that only the biological mother were doing was doing the nursing yeah. with the infants. So they weren't being passed around from teat to teat and kind of shared communal mommyhood. No. I always picture that being the way that it is with like ancient or current hunter-gatherer people. Yeah. I don't know. I always just picture the infants, like you said, not being able to tell who the parent is, but also just that all the mothers are kind of mothering all the kids. But I don't know where I yeah. got that necessarily. I mean, for sure, consoling the children and your kid walking around. Paul and I were up in this big rock area making arrows with some of these guys. And there was a kid up there basically playing with the fire. No one, no one cares about the it was, it was maybe like two. Couldn't even barely walk. Um, and then the dad told it to go away and he started walking down these rocks and like fell and stumbled down. <laughs> these rocks were like, it was maybe five feet uh, falling down the rocks. And then uh, mom or I don't know if it was the mom or whatever come over console the child and it was just totally normal like oh yeah not a big deal and then the kid was totally fine later that day they that same child tripped over a branch and it's another woman come up do the same thing so there's this always sort of this assurance that the kid is seen and heard and loved and there's not a big deal and i just saw that over and over and over again it's nothing it makes me think about like so many people have so much trauma that they have to deal with now in the western world whether it's acute trauma or it's, you know, abuse, rape, et cetera, or chronic trauma. I think that when it comes down to it, so much of, of what we do on autopilot is I'm not good enough. I don't feel loved. I don't feel heard. I don't feel seen. Of course, of course, that's the case. Think about, again, our life where we used to grow up in these settings where everybody was around. If the, ch- if the child had any sort of need, it would be met immediately. And that child would have confidence. Oh, people love me. I'm here. Like I'm accepted. I'm part of this tribe. I don't have to worry about anything else. I'm good. Now, people are born, and at months 18, they're being sent to preschool. In a lot of cases, the mom, after six weeks, has to go back to work. And the child has one person there, basically alone, looks up, starts crying. Nobody's there, maybe for a couple minutes. Whereas instantaneously, if any kid had any problem, somebody was there, always. Just think about like how much we're programmed from an early age in the Western world that someone's not there immediately. And I don't think people need to be coddled. I think this is like a very separate thing. So these, these children were not coddled at all. They were allowed just to learn as much as possible in the natural world, very dangerous settings as far as like I have perceived them, but immediate attention and care and love and appreciation and respect at all times. It's, it's almost impossible now, unless you have stay-at-home yeah. parents and in a community that you're raising kids in impossible but 24 7 these kids are surrounded by their adults wow that's powerful what about uh i guess it's unlikely that in the week you were there you witnessed anyone giving birth but do you know anything about their birth practices yeah they lose a lot of kids really yeah which if you actually look at pretty much any other mammal same birth success rates so they'll I think it's something like 50 to 60% of the children they lose. And this is the, a lot of the data around, well, hunter-gatherers don't live that long. And our life expectancy has gone up over time. It's just really corrected for infant mortality. And so when we've improved that, obviously the population has gone up. And that's great that we've saved a lot of infants that weren't able to, to make it otherwise. But when it comes down to it, this is like a normal thing for the human species, as with any other mammal. And that's just a reality that a lot of people don't like to accept. I mean, we saw it with COVID last year that, you know, we have this, this caretaker need where we feel like we need to save everybody all the time, which when it comes down to it, we're all going to die. At least, and that's how I think about it. We, we know where the technology is going to go soon here, but we're all going to die at some point. And death is a natural thing. I think that, again, another just huge difference, how they view death versus how Westerners view death. It's just like, it's not even a concept that they care about. No one thinks about it. We ask, like, what happens after you die? And they go, oh, well, we move camp because your body starts smelling. Wow. Yeah, wow. That's their answer. They have no wow. mythology, no existential angst, wow. no questions. Wow. They ask, like, what, well, where were you before you were born? And one of the women said, I don't know, but I can't know, so why would I care? And so it's just like, I'm here now, and that's all I know, and that's all that matters. And, like... You probably noticed this after the wild boar hunt that 
there's this moral it's a guilt around killing something this exchange of life and energy and this is what is so exciting for me to move to a farm is it's very spiritual for me we've like it casted away religion early on in life and i've like i think said i don't need it and now realizing like oh i need some sort of framework to like help understand my place in things and just being somewhere where things are born and die frequently plants insects animals all this type of stuff you just have a very different concept of life and death in your own place in it and these people are just like they think of themselves as equal to everything else that's living same as a lot of native americans it's like when you are living in this all the time you have no other concept no need for mythology and i'm sure somebody's written a book on this and then tell me i'm just ridiculous for saying this but like i just wonder if so much of this stuff around mythology comes from like when we started being in larger civilizations and needed a like, little bit more of a explanation of what was going on and why we're there. Whereas again, division from nature problem. And so, yeah, yeah. the lack of that was so fascinating to me. Yeah. That's wild, man. I'm going to take a moment to share one of my favorite products in the entire world with you. It's the Quinton and Quint Essential Sea Mineral Solution, which is a pure seawater harvested from satellite monitored plankton blooms. Now, for you water geeks in the episode, you might remember the prior episodes with our guest Robert Slovak, who is the guy responsible for bringing Quinton to North America and making it available through his company Water and Wellness. Now, I take both the hypertonic and isotonic formulas all the time, rotating back and forth between the two. When you get to the site, here's what you're going to look for. You've got the Quint Essential 3.3. Now, that's the same product as Quinton, but in really cool travel-friendly sachets. I use these all the time when I'm flying and taking long road trips, etc. The hypertonic helps support rapid hydration, stamina, muscle recovery, alertness, and bone health. Then you've got the Quint Essential 0.9, which is the same product as the Isotonic Quinton, but in travel-friendly sachets. The Isotonic can help replenish mineral and trace element levels, gently detoxify, support sleep, relaxation, and digestion. The Quinton Sea Mineral Solutions are just a non-negotiable product for me and one I use personally every single day, no joke. To get yours, here's what you do. Go to waterandwellness.com slash story. If you use the code LUKE10, you'll save 10% off on your order. Again, that's waterandwellness.com slash story, and the code is STORY10. You know, I think in our culture, by and large, there's a total denial of death, mm-hmm. right? And And perhaps that has something to do with our spiritual misunderstanding or lack of understanding around the fact that we're part of the fabric of consciousness Mm -hmm. and that we become so ego identified with our name, our body, this lifetime, you know, who we are in a concrete way that we just want to hang on to that so badly. And those that we care about, we want to hang on to them. Like it's just kind of built for attachment. And in these peoples, it sounds like there's much less attachment in general to everything, right? And that would just encompass also the fact that living beings come and go all the time and mm-hmm. that it's just not really a big deal. And also probably leans into that um, competition and scarcity model that there's not enough of everything, mm-hmm. including not enough time in my life. Therefore, I get to get everything. And, <laughs> and you know what I mean? And, right. and, and savor and protect this moment and me and mine and all of that sense of ownership and entitlement that comes with it. Yeah. And, and in the hunting experience for me, there was a lot of reconcili- reconciliation, not only around the fact that in nature, everything is eating everything all the time. Mm-hmm. Everything. That's all anything does is eat stuff. Literally. And have sex. Yeah. <laughs> and make more stuff. <laughs> um, but, you know, there was a real, like, deep reconciliation with my own mortality. Because if you watch that pig that was, quote, there, then not there, then that means my life could be extinguished just as quickly. So then it begs the question, well, what is my life and, and who am I? Like, am I this thing? Well, if this is all there is, that's, I mean, it'd be good to know, but I hope that's not the case. And the more I can kind of lean into the fact, or at least my perception and belief that, There's more to life than what presents here in this body as this personality called Luke. I start to loosen the reins a bit, right? It's like everything becomes a little less serious because I don't think 
this is my only shot, that when this consciousness leaves this body, that there are probably other possibilities. <laughs> you know, I don't know what they are, but perhaps those people see things in the same way as just an impermanence and a transient sort of nature, so that there's not so much panic around death. And you ask them, what happens when you die? Well, we got to move because the body starts to stink. I mean, from the Western perspective, that's so cold. Well, what about the body, you know, that the person that was inhabiting that body? And that's almost uh, of secondary importance mm -hmm. to just like the practicality of, well, those of us that are still here got to move on so that it's safe and comfortable. Yeah. It's just, it's wild. So cool. Yeah. I mean, when I hunt, it's the same thing where you go through that process of killing the animal. It's, it's there living and then it's not. And then you go through the butchering process and then you go through the cooking and sharing with friends process. And then like I had this, one of the first times I hunted and realized this, I was looking around, I was sharing a meal with I think six or seven people. And was just realizing, oh, that life is now sustaining this life and all their lives, they'll die and then sustain other lives. And that's just the way it is. And that's how it goes. So again, like it, the story you tell yourself after that, whether that's a, a, a next life, past life sort of thing, continuation of consciousness, or just a contribution to consciousness or whatever it is, it's undeniable when you look at it from like an energetic perspective, that there's a, this transfer of energy that happens that you're, you're a part of, humans are a part of. And when we remove ourselves from that, that just awareness that there's a cycle that we're in, so many of these things that we are worried about in the world happen and emerge. And this is why like, I'm so interested right now in the regenerative agriculture movement, as it's literally trying to solve so many problems, climate change, I think, but like healthy humans, healthy animals, moral standards, uh, but also some of these like metaphysical, spiritual things that just happen by default by reconnecting people to nature. Yeah. What about uh, what about how these people eat? You know, and that will segue us a bit into you know the never-ending debate on what the proper human diet is, which for me, ultimately, after all these years of being in this industry, is just kind of like mm, it's whatever my body's wanting that day is kind of how I eat. Now, sometimes the body goes, you want a couple pints of ice cream and I do my best not to listen to it when it's being, you know, uh, it, when it's kind of venturing in that direction. But uh, I think the interesting thing about our culture is around uh, the paleo movement and keto movement and stuff is that people are starting to integrate more organ meats, for example. Mm -hmm. And uh, from what I understand, not in a firsthand way like you have, but that in not so ancient times, people that lived off the land really prized the organ meats. And perhaps we don't prize them um, by and large because we're just not used to the flavor mm -hmm. of them and kind of just a different texture. And it's just a different thing as we learned eating raw bison heart and bison liver. I mean, it wasn't exactly palatable to me, but I, I felt the life force energy of it. It felt like, wow, this is really good for you. Right. My body responded to it, not so much my taste buds. So when it comes to this kind of um, hunter-gatherer eating nose to tail thing, what did you find that was intuitive to you or surprising to you about the way that they process these animals that they kill and what they eat and how they eat it? What's more important than mm -hmm. other parts, et cetera? So they eat the organs immediately. So they, they kill, like when, sometimes they'll butcher it immediately. Sometimes they'll take it to camp and then butcher it at camp. But regardless, when it gets butchered, organs go in the fire immediately and they're eaten. There's actually like an interesting debate here, whether it's, because they're prized intuitively for nutrition or because that's what spoils the fastest that they eat them the first, the first thing. Uh, so just an interesting sort of thing. That like is, we that have I all never these thought about that. in our head around like, oh, like humans just knew that these were the things. Where it's, or they just were the things that they knew. Like they can't cook the rest of the carcass till this thing's cooked anyways. It's like, there's a lot of things why it makes sense to eat the organs first. Right. The, the intestines go to the dogs for food, dog food. Everything else, every single thing else is eaten. Everything. The eyes? Eyes, so <laughs> oh, bro. Right, so everything. So this is where I draw the line so, on my on my hunter gatherness. So we we ate it with them a couple of times um, when like large animal calls. We had a couple cats that looked like little cats, but called genet cats, like little leopard things. Uh, baboon, a goat, um, a little. It's called a dick dick. It's kind of like a tiny antelope. So we saw this process a couple of times, but cut it open just the same as you would. With, I don't, did you guys butcher it all? Did you just send mm -hmm. the? We did, yeah. Okay. So same On thing, mushrooms. Like, <laughs> <it's intense experience. laughs> so yeah, just straight cut down the middle, take the organs out, feed the entrails of the dogs, eat the organ meat. So another thing was raw. 
They threw everything on the fire. So the organs go on the fire, directly on the fire. Take it off, eat that. What do they do? Put it on a skewer or something and kind of... Yeah, they do skewers okay. and they just stick it. So they have a fire belt up and they stick it in the dirt leaning there and then they turn it. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's pretty pretty simple, but inspirational setup. It's like, oh, you don't need much to make an amazing meal. Some of this meat was the, the best meat I've ever had. Um, and then they would cut quarter the animal and then start, you know, some of it, like they would cut it up into chunks and put it on a stick. Some of it would, they would just like throw the whole quarter or something on the fire. Um, the baboon first day, we had most of it. And then we came back the next morning and they had a fire going. The guy who had killed the baboon, had, the skull was in the fire. And every, I don't know, five, 10 minutes, he would take it off and then, you know, eat an eye and then put it back on and take it back off and like cut out the tongue and eat that and then put it back on, take it off, cut out the, cut off the ear. And then, you know, p- again, pass it around to everybody and then took the jaw off and ate all around the jaw and then put it back on, take it back off, cracked the skull open and then ate with a branch, the brains, which we did for sure. We obliged with everything and it was, uh, but like that experience, like nothing was gone to waste and they take everything that they use, the bones, any sort of tendons that are left over, the skin they make, cloth, everything's reused. Um, so I actually got a, the, the mandible, the jaw piece, um, is a little souvenir, which is intense. So have that as a reminder of wow. death and that, that way of life on my desk uh, when I work. Uh, yeah, every, every single thing is eaten. Like the, There was this eight-year-old kid, or roughly that age, that was smashing open a bone and sucking out the bone marrow is like most primal sort of representation of a human possible. So yeah, every single part they eat besides the guts would go to feed the dogs, which are instrumental in hunting. Dogs are instrumental. Yeah. So they're not like the family pet. They're, they're not utilitarian. They're, like they're part brutal of your... for the, to the dogs to not treat them well. They're very much a uh, workforce for the hunts. Wow. All right, I gotta, I gotta back up, and and this is, I have like all, all these notes that have nothing to do with any of this, but as as so goes the spontaneity of the lifestylist, um, the baboon man, like when I shot that boar and then butchered it the next day, I mean, you know, strangely, it was strangely normal. Actually, let me just say that, like, it was way less freaky than I thought it would be, but. And seeing a 150 pound pig hanging there without skin, it's not that different from a person. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's definite, what do you call it? Anthropomorphia. What's that? Uh, Anthropomorphism. Yes, yeah. that. I mean, it's like, oh, I'm not that different from that thing. And, and that's a bit jarring because you're like, well, if it can happen to that thing, then someone could cut me open like that and I would look the same kind of thing. But when you get into the, the primates, like baboons, monkeys, I mean, that's super close. To a person, how freaky was yeah. that for you? I was eating off of the forearm while the hand was still attached, and the wow. hand looked like a miniature human hand. Wow! And that was crazy for sure. Like that. Wow. that was an intense experience, and I was just, I looked at Paul. I was like, "Is this is this real?" Like, <laughs> here we are in the middle of Tanzania with these people who are like they're speaking Hadzabe around us, hunter gatherer tribe. It's so where humans evolved from. I'm eating a baboon like hand, basically. And then they would cut the hand off and like eat every chunk of the hand. But it looked like a human hand. Opposable thumb for sure. And it was intense for sure. I mean, this oh, but man. I don't know, my background, we decided to do a bunch of cadavers in um, when I was in grad school. And so I know what the human body looks like in depth. And any animal any animal that we kill and hunt is essentially the same after yeah, some differences, of course, but organs are in the same spots, same organs. It's like some slight differences, but yeah, you, you, same muscle groups, same tendon attachments, same joint placements. And so for me, it's like, yeah, it's a little weird, but I've hunted enough and I've seen so many things dissected and so many things butchered that I'm like, oh, okay, this is, now, this is, is that, all the same spectrum. Is that uh, like a traditional prey for them or are they just, Hmm. eating baboons because they've been forced out of their natural habitat and sequestered into this designated area where they don't have access to the variety of game that they would have in the past. That's correct. So um, yeah, they're, they're pushing this area. They would prefer an elephant if, if possible or a giraffe. Biggest possible. Like they want the same as any other human, the most amount of output with the least amount of work. That's what they want. And so hippos are like a huge delicacy for them. Like they have stories around big hunts. All of their storytelling all of their dreams, all of their fantasies, what gets them so excited is our big hunts, big successful hunts. 
And now some of these kids are growing up never having having seen one, which is crazy. Right. Wow. God, that's so interesting. Yeah, because the kids aren't sitting around on iPads going, someday I want a Ferrari. Yeah. And, and so, <laughs> right? or, I want Kim Kardashian's lips or whatever, you know. But like some of the older so people there, like, oh yeah, we like my grandfather used to go and bring back these big, crazy animals with all this fat. And the kids are like, wow. Is it's there good. is there any storing of the meat? Do they smoke anything or preserve anything in any way, or do they just eat and keep it moving? So all the ones that we saw were small enough animals where they can just eat them all okay. on the spot. But they do if it's a bit larger, they basically make jerky. So they'll cut it in small sections and then hang it over tree branches and then dry it over a couple of days, and then they will store that. Wow. Keep it with them. Wow. And w- were there any? Uh, and we'll and we'll move on from this. I'm just fascinated, but. Were there any um, like predatory animals that you guys had to be mindful of, whether it be poisonous snakes or lions? I mean, was there any danger involved in being immersed in the natural world in that way as possible prey for something no. else? I think if the setting would have been the game parks that we had saw before, and that's how life was, probably. However, where we were at, no. There's They made enough noise around each other and just the... The nature of, again, the surrounding area being more developing and having the herders around there, there's no chance that any sort of predatory animals are coming close. And, I mean, the reason why there's there's not a lot, of, a lot of things for the predatory animals to eat. Right. And so, right. If, like, the herbivores can't come in, then the carnivore and the predators aren't going to come in either. Right. So all the animals stay out. It's the same as here. It's like sometimes you'll see a deer when you're driving out to Dripping Springs, but like... Otherwise, you're not, you're not seeing many wild animals. You see squirrels and some birds. Right. I saw a zebra yesterday, just for the record. Well, that was, I'm sure it was not <laughs> I'm, a, I'm, wild. It's a wild Texan zebra <laughs> on the way to Marble Falls. Um, and when it comes to you know the tourism, the voyeuristic nature of this mm-hmm. type of experience, right, where a couple white dudes are going over to Africa to like play with and observe this tribe from one perspective that could seem, I don't know, it's like, I don't know what the word is. And I'm going like, you know, political correctness lens here almost, but one could be critical of that in the sense that like, you're going to an amusement park to observe Mm -hmm. these wild people. And I'm not being critical of it. It's just, I find it unfortunate that these people have been put in a position where their land has been taken away and they've been forced into an unnatural habitat but from what you were saying in the beginning, this tourism industry around people being able to go interact with them and observe them in this way, and I'm not minimizing these people to like a zoo animal, but for those that would think of it in that way, it sounds like this model is really assisting with their sustenance and their ability to keep going as a micro civilization. Yeah, yeah 100%. I mean, this is, this is my main concern when I was first offered to go. Uh, the guy who organized our trip, his name is Eric Edmeets. He's gone every year for the last 12 years. He said when he first went, they were one year away from being forced into the villages and like put into missionary camps. And then he started getting people out there. And then they, the government goes, oh man, these people really want to live this way. And the he, pe- other people really want to come see them live this way. So we're going to make something of it and we're going to give them this little area. And so without people going, they would can be completely vanished by now. 10 plus years wow. ago. Uh, wow. The guy who organized the trip for us, Paul and I are trying to set up something where we can help people go to see this whole thing, have some of the proceeds go to buying them more land or figuring out some way to expand their area of, of land or e- even just getting them animals. And like one of the things we gave, gave them as a gift was a goat from one of their neighboring tribes. They don't have anything of value, so they can't trade anything for the goat, but they obviously prefer animal f- food over the ugali that they get. So they get the cornmeal from the missionaries. They have, have to eat to survive. But they 100% prefer animals. So even if we were to, you were to buy them goats every week, they would love that and get way better nourishment than eating cornmeal. Um, but Gasper is the guy who leads the tours there. It's, it's N-E-E-K-O Tours. And I can give you the information you can put in the show notes if anybody's interested yeah, in contacting Gasper. Phenomenal human. Tremendous human. He's, he's doing whatever he can. He's been going to see them for like 15 plus years. Um, he grew up around the area, so he has this deep reverence for these people and wants to help them as much as humanly possible. So, yeah, everyone who is participating in this out there, that's like quote unquote eco tourism, is all like trying to preserve these people's way of life. I mean, it's the same thing we do with endangered 
animals in the wild. Like sometimes we have to put up boundaries, get them in a specific area to like create another habitat and then get the habitat expanded so that way they can survive. But the way it's going right now, I wouldn't anticipate them being around for another generation, which is incredibly wow. sad. Oh man. And they have no written language, so there's nothing recorded. And there's just a bunch of erroneous accounts of research papers of people going to see them and saying they have you're eating 150 grams of fiber, et cetera. And it makes me fascinating other people too. Like what what is what are the uh the lies that are out about other traditional people and how long do these people have? It's just a matter of time before we have no representation left of how humans used to live. God, humans are such bastards. Why, why do we mess with people so much? It's just like when you look at what's going on in the Amazon, you know, and the the indigenous peoples yeah. there that are just barely hanging on in the middle of the jungle, and then the oil companies come in and just decimate the landscape. It's just like, God, what is it about people? I just find it's so reprehensible, the tendency for, I don't know, of yeah. that imperialistic kind of just why can't anyone just leave people alone? <laughs> you know? I mean, again, it's I'm, like, I'm going to bring you back to the division of to, to nature. Like you have no respect right. for other people or resources or the planet when you live in a box and buy things that surround you at all times that just feed more and more greed and which essentially is there because fear that you can't have things and you're going to die like we talked about. And it's just yeah. this just crazy loop. I wonder if, if all of this is really at the root of it and my paleo friends would would love this perspective but it seems like this ability for natural humans to live on the land in their said tribes all over it seemed like the biggest hit toward that was when we figured out how to farm like the agricultural revolution and then we started having to have a military force to protect our land that we claimed and then warring amongst tribes for resources and then building villages townships, eventually cities, right? And then that mental illness and that, I don't know, the, just the inherent greed in that uh, possessiveness of resources seemed to have kind of stemmed out of that. Now, I wasn't around. I don't, I'm sure it was no party right. before that, right? You had plagues and I'm sure warring, you know, factions of humans fucking with each other. But it seems like when we settled down and started sitting on our ass and growing food, that's when it went really wonky. Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. And it's just interesting also to see the Hadza compared to the pastoralists next to them and people in the village next to them and then the larger city and the large, like the more you left the Hadza, which were incredibly happy people, happiest people I've ever met in my life, you lose a little bit of that every time. And then when the people were in the larger cities, the most unhappy, the most desperate, the most amount of crime. There's no crime in the Hadza. Absolutely not. And it was just really interesting to see that so clearly both going in there and going out of there, that stark difference, an inverse sort of correlation to civilization leading to this unhappiness. Right. That's it's crazy because the civilization from that context is actually de-civilization, right? 100%. When you're living in a tribe where there's no crime, no one can get away with anything. They don't feel the need to get away with anything because everyone's providing for one another in a sense of community, right? Like that is actually more civilized, albeit you're cracking open the head of a baboon and eating the brain which would seem savage to some, but like based on interpersonal relationships and emotional and mental health seems from your purview, uh, more civilized mm -hmm. than when you get into a city and someone will kill you to take your car. Yeah. You get desperation because right? people need things that they're not given and they don't have any know how to get those things. Right. But yeah, Christopher Ryan wrote an excellent book on this topic called civilized death that sort of explores a lot of these things, but yeah, there's, yeah, wow. Could go on on this stuff. What a rabbit hole. Paul, yeah, yeah like Paul I, and I just, it was so many long chats about this stuff when we were there and just kind of shocked at all of the things that kept coming up and just how it translated to like, man, what the hell went wrong? And you make this point about ag agriculture. And I think that a lot of people have this in their minds. Once we started farming, that ruined everything. And thus, farming is bad. I think that all these connections are made. And I actually think it's, it's probably a little bit different where, like humans domination over nature led to the need to farm and the ability to farm and the thought of farming. And so I think that like before agriculture, there was actually massive overhunting because we had tools. So like we figured out how to make tools with things that were around, kill animals at a much larger scale and dominate the, the nature and like ruin ecosystems that way. 
there's no balance anymore. Right. So it's the dominionistic relationship of humans to the environment. There's a yes. break somewhere in there over time where we see all of life as separate from us and of utilitarian value rather than something of which we are a part. Correct. Right? That's that's my hypothesis. Like, yeah. It just seems like every... Because you can farm with... like All farming, essentially, majority of it is done in this mindset now. And you can see the parallels and how terrible it is. Right. You can also do it in a way that is responsible of the ecosystem. I mean, Rome's a good example where the intention of the farming and the agriculture is actually to restore the ecosystem. It's kind of like ironic that most people think that agriculture screwed everything up. And but like, we need agriculture now to save everything. Right. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> right. Yeah. The thing that like, yeah, I, I like that. The thing that kind of was the downfall of civilization is probably the thing that's going to save us. Yeah. When you go out to Rome Ranch, which he's referring to guys is where we went to the, uh, the bison harvest. Uh, and yeah, I mean, they're showing just, they have these great models where they show soil erosion with all the different types of farming practices. And it's just, it's incredible just to see what regenerative farming can do. And I'm actually interviewing uh, Robbie here nice. uh, tomorrow, actually. So uh, one of these shows will come out in pretty close proximity, but yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the cyclical nature of that particular thing. And there, there really is, I guess, when you look at this stuff philosophically, there's no right or wrong. I think we want to, myself included, find like the one thing we did wrong and let's fix that when it's, mm. you know, it's a culmination of tens of thousands of years in these epochs of time, right? Where we've trended one way or another. And um, the trend that seems to be the culprit by and large is our disconnection from nature and our, hundred percent, you know, just our innate wisdom of knowing that we are not separate from that out there, but we are actually part of the fabric of all of nature. And there, and there comes that respect for nature too, mm. right? When you, think that you have dominion over nature and because you have a, a more functional prefrontal cortex than your average animal that therefore you rule the land mm -hmm. right as a human and that's that kind of just uh, arrogant egoist point of view that causes us so many problems in general yeah, yeah. And I, I, like, that that's why I, i'd less likely go down the road of the agriculture was the thing more so it was like the innate human domination over nature that led us to this path and then you, you mean again you see it but when you have the union again of humans and nature and going with the flow instead of trying to disrupt it and there's like a lot of great thinkers in this space wendell berry west jackson all the leopold etc like these guys who are either dead or 80 90 years old who've been talking about this stuff for a long period of time they've been they've been calling this stuff forever and there's a lot to learn out there about just this i don't know this this return to the land i think it's going to be a new big health trend sort of like uh, all these questions we're asking ourselves how to live how to exist and what to eat and how to sleep like everything sort of solves itself when you return to land and farming youtube community is the most engaged and most viewed youtube community and all really? know, yeah it's crazy wow. people are sitting there not in cubicles in their zoo cages watching this farm porn <laughs> <laughs> like oh man i think like we subconsciously know that there's this yeah. this place here yeah. and so the question is like how does how does one actually go about this transition in a meaningful way like farmland is getting extremely expensive it's getting prohibitively expensive like you have to make enough money to not have to farm to buy a farm right and this is a, this is a problem i think in in austin what i'm seeing is a lot of i haven't seen it concretized and come to fruition but there are a lot of murmurs about micro communities right people oh this guy's getting 300 acres and we're all going to live there and mm -hmm. live in a communal way and do regenerative farming and things there's probably three or four different groups of people i know that are at some stage of bringing that together so perhaps that's that's the way because of the prohibitive nature of farmland cost right yeah. perhaps it is in a communal then I always arrive at, all right, well, who's the guru, right? It's like, right. Who, who's who's the chief that's like running things? You, you're really going to be egalitarian about it? Like we're still people. So how do you get people that are of a certain level of consciousness to come together that do have the capacity to really contribute in, uh, in an equal manner to each person to bring their resources, whatever they might be, and mm -hmm. skills to the table, but not have this corruption of 
power or control that human beings just seem so prone to. Yeah, I mean, when we have a society that we all come from as well, cultural norms, things like that, that have permeated our consciousness that we can't just strip away. And so I, I don't have the answers either. And this is where I read some of these guys like uh, Wes Jackson and Wendell Berry, phenomenal writers, have a lot of good ideas, but it comes down to it, like, how do you actually merge that with modern society? And I don't, I don't have any answers yet, but I'm exploring it and like really curious. Well, about, you got your farm, bro. That's yeah, a good start. We'll see. But then I mean, again, we talked about, if we have kids, my fiance and I, it's like, where are the people going to be for all time, for the whole time to give my kid love and affection when I'm not there because I'm doing, feeding the chickens. Yeah. You we're know? doing a podcast. We're doing a podcast. It, it doesn't matter. <laughs> there's, there's, it's a really challenging way to think about how this wow. actually manifests. And I, think, I think we're, we can't return to this way of life, but going back to nature to some degree, whatever that looks like for anybody is I think the path to more sanity, both yeah. in like physical health, mental health, et cetera. Yeah. And the, the interesting thing about the chiefs, there were no chiefs in this tribe until people could start to come visiting them. And then Westerners brought things for them, gifts, whatever resources, airheads. And they had to figure out Who's going to communicate with these people? Who's going to divvy up these resources? Who's going to do all this stuff? Used to be egalitarian. Now have to have a chief structure because people came in. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Huh. Wild. What a journey. I'm all down with it, except for the 20 mile hike. <laughs> it was intense. It was intense. <laughs> but, yeah. Sounds like oh, 20 miles. Yeah, yeah, I could do that. You know, you just get re no. 20 well, miles is a long ass way, and the baboon man, that's yeah. a, that's an edge. After about that's a hard edge. 10, 12 miles, when we got close to the baboons. These guys would drop into a sprint immediately and go just zipping off, and it was a pretty fast pace. Paul and I were the only people of I think eight or 10 that kept up the whole time. It was wild. And so no joke. These guys wow. are moving. Yeah, yeah wow. we were we were pretty winded. It was it was tough to keep up, but it was just their normal thing. They were just getting lunch. Wow. Well, I feel like we just did a podcast, but <laughs> I have you here and there the I, I keep going. You're a keto guy, you know. You're at least, you know, you built a company. I'm just a guy who helped people with ketogenic diet. Yes. Who does keto sometimes myself. Yes. And I like that you say you do it sometimes because I've tried to do it all the time and it's just not for me, it's not practical. But that said, you know, you had this company, Perfect Keto, mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think, how I found you because I was like, ooh, I want to get into some of these keto products and stuff like that. And you produce a lot of content that educates people around that. But I also like your perspective on it because you're not dogmatic and you don't think like everyone being keto is the, the answer to all the world's problems. It's like, okay, if you're really ill, perhaps you might want to go a little more. This is me just interpreting your work perhaps someone who's really ill might want to be a bit more aggressive about some foods they eat and some they don't. But it seems like to me, in your personal life, you have a pretty balanced perspective on it. Um, however, because I've never talked about keto on this show, I do want to like maybe just whiz through a, yeah. bit, a bit of a introductory uh, exploration for people. Um, and I know there's a lot of content out there, so it's redundant for me to spend three hours talking about keto because there's a lot of information. But just for my audience who are like, yeah, I kind of started seeing that at Whole Foods. There's a keto section. Now, what the hell is that? I want to give kind of the dummies guide to keto. Uh, first one is just what is ketosis? What are ketones? What is being in the keto food space look yeah. like? So I'll just preface this by saying that I think that with nutrition, in all things in life, I think there's some fundamental truths. And then on top of that, building blocks and like, you can sort of choose your own adventure. And I think with nutrition, the best thing you do is eat local food that, and like real food, food that spoils. Yeah, obviously we sell products that are not that. And that's totally fine. I think there's a place for them and we talk about that. But that's what I believe. I think people should be eating real food. Then we start talking about like, you know, should I eat more carbs or fat or protein or plant food or animal food or whatever? That's kind of a choose your own adventure. And I think it, it, a lot of things work for every, everybody. I don't think eating non-real food works for people. Like I don't think it works for humans. So I think that as, if you have that as a common understanding that if people can eat real food, then you can start choosing depending on your background, your goals, whatever you want. So keto is just a tool to help you get goals depending on your background. So if, you're, if your goal is to lose fat, reduce inflammation, treat some uh, conditions like cancer, neurodegenerative disease, epilepsy, things like that. I think it's a phenomenal tool. Endurance sports, great tool. 
Does that mean everybody needs to do it? Absolutely not. So what is it? It's very simply when you restrict your body's um, intake of carbohydrates, your body starts breaking down fats and fatty acids into ketones, and you can use ketones for energy. So it's very simple way to think about it. So you're burning fat for fuel instead of burning carbohydrates for fuel. So when you eat things, they're carbohydrates, fat, or protein, or alcohol, but it's a, we'll keep that to the side for now. Protein's more of a building block. Carbs or fat are more of an energy source. So you need both for sure. So protein scaffolding, energy comes from fat or, pro, or, or carbohydrates, which make the engine go. So fat leading to ketones and running exclusively on fat, that's what ketosis is. It's very basic. So. Got it. Okay. I kind of knew that, but I just want to set the framework. I've been a huge proponent of eliminating blue and green light from your nighttime environment for a long time. So I've gone so far as to wear blue light blocking eyewear inside at night, covering up anything that has a blue light with red tape, all kinds of stuff. But one thing that's been really difficult is finding the perfect bulb. So I was stoked when I found that Blue Blocks, one of my favorite companies, has developed a light called the Lumi Sleep Plus. These lights emit only red light. So there's no blue light, no green, yellow, orange, just pure red, which is optimal for melatonin production and thus sleep. Another badass thing they did was add a converter to the bulb switchboard that turns the current from AC to DC, which lowers the EMF and reduces the flicker to almost non-existent levels. You might be asking, what's flicker? Who cares? Well, flicker is when a light turns on and off really fast, so fast that your conscious mind can't see it, but your brain can. And flicker can cause all sorts of neurological issues like migraines, headaches, and even photosensitive epilepsy. Yeah, it's that bad. Now, a lot of the crappier bulbs on the market not only flicker and create blue light, but many of them are powered by Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, which increases EMF. Now, the Lumi bulbs don't run on Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, which means very low EMF readings, if any at all. They're also non-dimmable, as dimming a light will increase flicker and the EMF rates. The spectrum of light that the Lumi bulbs produce is the light we've evolved with at night. So think of our ancestors only using campfires and firelight at night. We can actually reproduce that now with the Lumi bulbs. They also have a really long lifespan, 25,000 hours. They've got an E26 fitting available, which fits most standard USA lights and lamps. So if you want to check out the Lumi bulbs, here's what you do. Go to blueblocks.com slash lifestylist. That's B-L-U-B-L-O-X.com, blueblocks.com slash lifestylist. And if you want to save 15% off your Lumi bulbs, use the code lifestylist. Again, blueblocks.com slash lifestylist. If one wanted to pursue being in ketosis more of the time, what do you recommend for tracking? And let's just you know, preface this by saying if somebody wants to go full keto, you're limiting your carb intake to about how many grams a day? It's entirely dependent on the individual. It depends on the person. Yeah. So okay. it can be any as low as 15 and as high as 150. Okay. On the person. okay. So and you know, like Ben Greenfield, for example, shared with him, he's like, he's producing ketones the next day after eating 150 grams of carbs in a day. Most people can't get away with that because they don't. They don't look like him. They don't have the amount of muscles soaking up the, the glucose. They don't exercise as much as him, et cetera. I've, so I've worked with some old ladies who basically can eat zero carbs or else it, it, their body switches into burning glucose for energy. And then because you don't have the glucose for energy, you have this huge energy suck and energy demand and you feel terrible. So it, it, it's a trick. It's tricky for the individual, but like Got everything it. in nutrition is, it depends on the individual and their goals and their background. Got it. Okay. And in terms of, Say you just want to do a, a a clean start, and you're like, I'm just going to stop eating carbs. I'm only going to eat fat and protein. What do you think is an effective way to actually monitor whether or not you're in ketosis? I've used these little um, glucose and ketone uh, blood pricking things from mm-hmm. I think it's Keto Mojo. I think is the company, and then you put in a little reader, and it reads on an app on your phone. It seems pretty accurate. I could just never, like, I swear to God, I must fall out of ketosis so easy because I feel like I don't eat any carbs. And I'm like, what the hell? I'm just barely in like yeah. light ketosis. It seems for my body hard to get into, but I know Perfect Keto has some little urine strips. Are, uh, what's the, um, you know, the accuracy of these different ways of testing just to see if you are starting to tiptoe into that range or not? Yeah, so 
being in ketosis for the first time, but most people have never been in ketosis in their entire life. These pods of people we were with, it was the entire time because they weren't eating any carbohydrates. So they were just living in a state of ketosis. I wanted to bring a, a blood meter, but you have to have permits to do anything with blood work with them. So I didn't get to do that, unfortunately, just because I was curious, like what are their, the levels of ketones in their blood? So when you stop eating carbohydrates, your body will start breaking down fats for into ketones, and then they start floating in your bloodstream. Those then get excreted also through your, your breath and your urine, as well in your, in your blood. Your blood's the most accurate way to test, but this is sort of a, like, when you're just getting into ketosis, it's a good marker because you're going to go from zero and then you'll start climbing up, especially if like, you've never been in ketosis before. Your body, like your cells literally don't have any uh, transporters to bring the ketones into the, the cells for energy. And so you'll have a much higher level of ketones in your blood because you're not using them in your tissues. But if you're going in and out of ketos- ketosis all the time, or you've been doing it for a longer period of time, especially if you're having a lot of uh, act- activity, exercise, or have a lot of muscle mass, you actually have much lower levels of ketosis. And so these charts that say, like, oh, 0.5 or 0.8 or 1.0, you're in ketosis, good, don't really matter for a couple of reasons. One, because you could be soaking them up in your tissues and using them for, for energy, which is good. You want that. Uh, but secondarily, it doesn't really matter Like, in, if you have 0.5 versus 2.0 millimolar is what I'm talking about here in your blood, measuring it. Unless you're managing a condition like cancer or epilepsy, it doesn't really matter the amount or level of ketones that you have. So I go more around feel. So if it's easy to not be hungry, like if, you can, if you can skip breakfast and lunch easily, you have high energy and focus throughout the day, and you don't feel like crap, probably you're in ketosis. Or it's like that's you, funny because that's, that's how I feel yeah. most so of the time. You're, you're probably able to use both glu- glucose and ketones. But okay. again, most people have never done this before. So the shift in the cellular sort of maintenance and cleanup and changeover where it's required to use ketones is just really, really challenging. And it can take anywhere from two to 16 weeks, to, again, depending on the individual, to sort of like get this engine running again. So that way you can comfortably fast for long periods of time, have high mental focus. Like there's, there's a reason to use it strategically. And again, like if, if your metabolism is a, in an appropriate state, um, then it's great. So, I mean, the main reason why people I think should do this is because people overeat processed food. I think the initial thing that was thought when ketos started becoming popular is people are overeating carbohydrates. Therefore, restricting them is good because it leads to these ketone things and the ketones are, are a different fuel source. I actually don't believe that anymore. I think I've switched my mind pretty aggressively. I think the problem is that people are overeating seed oils, vegetable oils, so corn, cottonseed, canola, safflower, sunflower, soybean, peanut, uh, grapeseed, rapeseed, overeating these fatty acids that actually completely screw up your mitochondria and your cell's ability to burn any energy. So if you have carbohydrates, your body has no idea what to do with them. So if you take them away, that's good because you'll start burning fat again and doing some things. But I've worked with so many people that remove carbohydrates when on ketosis, plus a little bit better, hit some weight loss plateaus, all these problems. Um, then we removed the vegetable oils and seed oils, and it was like they're a new person entirely. Then they could go back to eating carbohydrates. It's kind of this thing like I see in carnivore oh, all the time. interesting. So it's almost like you have to detox from the, the, um, the bad seed oils, the yeah. oxidated, oxidated uh, fats, in order to get things running again. Mm-hmm. I see the same thing in the carnivore diet, in the carnivore community, where people go, oh, I ate carnivore, and I felt amazing. But if I eat spinach, like I'll get psoriasis all over my face and neck and body. It's like, are you sure that you fix the problem or are you just avoiding the, the insult? Like humans should be able to eat a leafy green and not die. And so this fear, same thing with, with people who are on ketosis, who restrict carbohydrates and then add them back in and can't tolerate them. You didn't fix the underlying problem. And it's, I, I think of it kind of like a physical injury. So if you're walking off of a curb and you trip and you roll your ankle, you can heal that ankle in six to eight weeks, no problem. If you break the ankle, you know, maybe six to eight months, if you get run over by a bus, you have to have your foot amputated or put some rods in there, you're never going to regain full function. Same thing with your cellular processes and your mitochondria and some of these things where if you have, if you're eating the most processed junk, having a toxic lifestyle, living in the zoo for your entire life, super obese, you have all these chronic disease patterns going on, you probably can't get away with eating carbohydrates ever again because your, your cells are so messed up. But for the bulk amount of the population, removing it, yes, is going to be helpful. 
but it's because your cells aren't able to process the carbohydrates, not because the, pro- ca- the carbohydrates are inherently bad themselves. And so the, you have to ask a question like, why can't the cells process the carbohydrates? And I've been geeking out a lot on this lately, lately and just like diving in. And I think it's due to the massive consumption of seed oils. Wow, that's so interesting. I was expecting a much more black and white <laughs> like breakdown of this. I'm like, oh. It's just- it always gets more complicated. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but that 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 makes a lot of sense actually. Um, and I think that this is where it gets unfortunate because the the keto space is they're doing a lot of great work. People in it are amazing, and there's a lot of great stories. However, people are equating eating a banana or an apple to drinking a, a Coca Cola, and it's insane. It is absolutely insane. And I think that the fear of fruit and the fear of carbohydrates is leading to a lot of orthorexia. And I think that the same thing happens to the the carnivore community. Like, yes, I think animal products are phenomenal and the most nutritious things we can eat does not mean that eating broccoli is going to kill you. Do you and Saladino uh, go around about this stuff? I I will take credit and say that I got him, or at least I I nudged him over the course of the last few years to start eating stuff. And we actually went to Costa Rica after um, Africa. And he's eating all this fruit Wow, okay. eating, eating dates, like eating, like honey was the first thing I saw with him. This ski trip we went a couple of years ago. I was like, I'm proud of him. He's sort of loosening up a little bit and adding some stuff in. And it's, that's the thing like I look for in people, my friends, people I trust for information is, are you on record changing your mind about something? So I wrote a book about keto stuff, mentioned this whole carbohydrate insulin model hypothesis. I was wrong. I was hundred percent wrong, but you know, what's great is that you can change your mind, you can learn and you can adapt. And I think like seeing that with other people is great. And that gives me a sign of trust that they're willing to be open and learn and adapt. And this is just like the new information that came out. Like we, no one should have had this information five years ago when the whole keto thing started to explode. But so many people are get dogmatic and put their reputations on the line of, you know, we saw this last year in COVID. You know, you can't be wrong. You can't publicly say you're wrong because you're too scared of this, you know, egoic representation of yourself as this thing instead of the conduit for truth is kind of like how myself or probably Paul would explain who they are with like the work they do. It's like, I just want to find the truth and get it out there. And this is like when I saw people not reacting to taking carbohydrates away, it's like, okay, something else is happening here. I always bought, I knew that they I knew that the seed oils were bad and I knew that people needed to get them out, but the interaction with the mitochondria and how that led to people being unable to process carbohydrates, thus needing to be in keto is something that was just completely just uncovered, I would say five years ago. I have an interesting thing to run by you and it's a little obscure and I don't know that you'll have input on it, but uh, maybe it was four years ago or so I interviewed a few of the leaders around the deuterium depletion Hmm. idea. Do you know about this deuterium? It's a heavy hydrogen, yeah. gums up the nanomotors in your mitochondria, makes them uh, have a much harder time producing ATP. One of the most powerful interventions for some types of cancer, as I'm sure you know, is going like hardcore keto. Mm-hmm. And these people that I interviewed, Dr. Q Collins, who's a PhD immunologist, and Dr. Laszlo Boros, who's a professor at UCLA of something, they were the people that I interviewed about this deuterium. and they both believed that one of the reasons, if not the primary reason that a that, uh, uh, keto diet works for people with metabolic diseases and certain types of cancer is because it's a low deuterium diet and you're cutting out all uh, exogenous deuterium. You're not taking mm-hmm. any new deuterium in. And so when you're in ketosis, then your body starts to produce metabolic water or exclusions on water and you start to deplete your own deuterium. And that's where the mitochondrial function gets restored. Have you heard anything around that? Does that make sense at all to you? You're telling me you've never talked about keto or any of this stuff before. This is crazy (laughs) deep dive four years ago. I Uh, I mean, uh, I have not heard of that theory. It's super interesting. Uh, It's trippy, right? Yeah. Because because they just take it back to metabolic diseases and the metabolism and mitochondria. And so I was like, oh, that's interesting. And I do cycles of the deuterium depleted water and watch my levels measurably go down in the course of two or three months. I don't have cancer, but they're like, yeah, if you had cancer, you would want to drink the deuterium depleted water and also go strict keto. So yeah. just an interesting bit of information I came across. Interesting. Additionally, this is the most yeah. important thing about keto. People with a low quality keto thing, it was like, oh, macro is the only thing that matters. I'm eating high fat. I've seen so many people add in then more vegetable oils, more seed oils. 
and so maybe go oh yeah drink the low deuterium water go keto but just eat whatever fat as long as you hit these numbers and you, you eat these vegetable oils and seed oils complete destruction oh wow it's way worse every conditions get way worse wow and that's worse. not all fat is created equal then right 100 percent. yeah would you say seed oils uh are one of the main offenders in our modern diet that are the most toxic and destructive number one yeah number one really by far wow unquestionable to me wow by far number one and it, there's a few different reasons so I think about it, it's like there's three main things that make people sick in combination, especially. And first one, processed um, fats, refined fats. Second one, refined grains. Third, refined sugars, carbohydrates. Um, if you look at it from the reverse order, how long these are damaging your system, sugar is like a couple hours. It's basically out of your system. And it's done its damage, and you've rebounded. You have this sugar crash, leads, leads to these advanced location end products. There's all these different down downstream effects of sugar in the body. Not great, but also not going to, I think, kill a lot of people. The next one's refined grains, which have things like these proteins that people know of, gluten, gliadin, et cetera, saponins, like all these things in grains. Paul has a lot of resources about this, being the kind of work guy he is, why they're not great for people. The paleo people have also gone down this route, but they can damage your gut lining. You have anywhere from like two, like one to two weeks after you eat refined grains, especially. Wow, really? Where it has inflammation in the gut. Like your, your gut lining can literally break down and for those cells to repair themselves take about a week. So if you're eating a cheat meal every week, you're having to like rebuild your gut all the time. How do you expect your gut to function normally while it's in rebuild mode all the time? Seed oils get embedded into your nervous tissue, into all of your cell walls for two years. Wow. And in your mitochondria and have oxidative um, communication to adjacent cells caught, wreak havoc, havoc for two years. And if they're embedded into your fat cells and you're not losing fat, but let's say you start going on a diet, you have two years, as long as you keep losing fat within there, it's in your body causing inflammation. Wow. So if you like go to any restaurant, I found it almost impossible. We're, we're homeless right now here in Austin, bouncing around having to eat out a little bit more. I've gone to several restaurants now where they cannot give me one item of food that doesn't have vegetable oil in it. These are like not seedy little strip mall types of things. These are like nice new restaurants. Are these also like what one would call farm to table restaurants where the, some, the, some, the meat's yes, grass yeah. fed and yeah. all this kind of stuff? Yeah. And I asked for steak. Nope. Can't, can't cook it without oil. Like, ha, just put it on the grill. Like it, People don't understand how pervasive these polyunsaturated fatty acid oils are. It's, it is Again, I think the most catastrophic thing in all of human health. I think this multifactorial deuterium probably adds to it. Being inside, being in our screens, not having good relationships, not having purpose or meaning, like not not sleeping, not moving, all of these things add up for sure. But if I were to put my money on one thing, that if we removed it, we'd see an enormous benefit of health across the entire species, it's seed oils, 100%. Wow, damn. Yeah, that is that is troublesome when you eat out, even if you're going to some place that's largely organic. And I always look on the menu, and I'm looking for that thing where it says we we get our produce and you know meat from local farms. So I'm like, ah, oh, I'm safe. Yeah. But like back in the kitchen, they probably have an industrial size can of the you know canola oil that they're using to cook with. I'm like, it, yeah. what? So if we wanted to cook with the fat, like you said, I mean, I don't know if you have kind of fatty meat. I don't think you really need anything. But if I do, I'll put a little bit of ghee in a pan that's kind of my cooking fat yeah. what do you recommend if somebody feels like they need to cook with fats and they want to avoid all the seed oils yeah people have this cognitive dissonance where they don't understand that you can cook without liquid oil people think that liquid oil is necessary to make salads it's necessary to make anything in a pan and it's not like solid fat turns to liquid with heat so you can just use that so any sort of solid fat i think is ideal um, if you have butter or ghee if you have any sort of dairy sensitivities that can be an issue but tallow is a great source, which is just rendered beef fat. Um, the issue here that I think is not communicated about at all. So there's a specific fatty acid in these seed oils called linoleic acid. It's an 18 carbon polyunsaturated fatty acid that causes all this problem. I think there's probably some other things that are inflammatory as well. Like this is like the main thing that we sh we used to eat about 1%. And now people are eating 10, 20, 30 plus percent of this specific fatty acid that like is embedded into our cells. It's embedded in our mitochondria. 
screws up these things called cardiolipins. There's like all these downstream effects. It has over 400 known toxic metabolites, known. So if we eat this, wow. like you just, it's in your cells, it's just secreting all of these toxic metabolites that just cause all these problems. Like this is not, this is not a question. This is unequivocal. This is a, this is just a scientific fact. Nobody talks about it. So you think, okay, animal fat should be fine. Carnivore people do this. They eat a lot of pork and chicken. What are the pork and chicken eating? Like what are the pigs and chickens eating? They're eating high amounts of corn and soy. And so this corn and soy has super high amount of linoleic acid. And so you actually get like, so in canola oil, for example, we talked about terrible it's from the seed. Like what the hell is a canola? It's just, like there's like several thousand canola seeds that have to be pressed and processed into oil. And that's about 18, 20% linoleic acid. Most chicken is 40% linoleic acid. So you can, wow. you can feed a chicken soybeans, 10% linoleic acid or so. When they eat it, it bioaccumulates to 40% in their tissues. Pig, same thing. And so our entire farming industry is set up to make these animals that eat corn and soy, but then we're eating all the things in the animals and then it goes into us. Like, whereas a cow, counterintuitively, like you can actually feed a cow a Snickers bar or corn and soy, whatever, because of their digestive tract. They turn all of that, they chop all these fats down into two carbon chains and build them back up in the saturated fatty acids. Like you can feed a cow grass or you can feed it soy and the fatty acid composition is actually the same exact thing. Wow. Whereas a chicken or a pig, because they're monogastric like us, they only have one stomach, any fatty acid that they consume goes into their tissues. And we see this in humans as well. It's, it's, wow. it's frightening. And so- it, Trippy. Yeah. yeah, I always think it's funny when uh, I'm always shopping- I, I, I don't like eat eggs because I like the taste, but I just put egg yolks in my smoothies, you know? So I'm always like reading the package. I'm looking for all the things. And one of the things I find really funny in the marketing of eggs is it'll say vegetarian chickens. <laughs> and I'm like, Ch birds aren't vegetarians. You know, it's like the last thing you want to eat is a vegetarian chicken because that, I didn't even know this part, but I'm like, well, what are they feeding it then, right? Like, I got another, got another fun fact for you. What? Chickens. No matter what chicken you buy, every chicken you've ever eaten has been fed corn and soy. God damn it. There is no such thing as a pasture chicken. What? Like technically the, the birds may be out on pasture, but chickens aren't pasture animals anyways. They're, they're roosting animals, which are being trees. So it doesn't even make any sense. But even when they are, every single one, we have only two breeds that people eat, Cornish Cross or Freedom Rangers. And if they are not fed corn and soy, they will literally die. Really? Yes. So like, okay, these animals are out on pasture. You have this image of them foraging for bugs and whatever. They get crazy amount of supplemental feed. There would not be a chicken industry and you would not have chicken in the grocery store without corn and soy. Like, it's impossible. So wow. you, can, you cannot currently buy a chicken that has low amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids. Wow. That doesn't eat corn and soy. And that's true of the eggs too then, huh? Eggs. Eggs have this weird thing. Because I don't really yeah. eat chicken meat i just don't just don't like it but i i crush eggs just because i want the you yeah. know vitamin a and all the things so eggs have interesting i don't know if this is like a protective mechanism to make a new thing but eggs have the yolks have hydrosylates in them that block the uptake of linoleic acid oh sweet because so i don't eat the yolks yeah. either I always just wash them down the drain and oh, I just eat the little orange bit. That's nature's multivitamin right there. Really? Yeah. The the uh, uh, the whites, I'm oh, sorry. Okay. The whites. Yes. I always wash the whites away because it's just, I don't know. Weird. Intuitively, just gross. Yeah. Yeah. So, did I say I washed the yolks yeah. away? <laughs> like, dumbass, no, don't do that. No, <laughs> the, the guy other... ordering egg white yeah, <laughs> yeah, omelet yeah, the, the other hotel. Way, like a... The other way around. Yeah. Yeah. So this is actually something I'm going to try to do at my farm is look into how can these animals be raised with different food inputs, with low like acid food inputs that are as cheap as these monocrop corn and soy, but also lead to the same weight in the same amount of time. This is the big thing about farmers. Like you need to get the animal to wait in a certain amount of time. And that's kind of like the whole business. Yeah. Is do as many rounds as possible. And the chickens right now, the Cornish cross, 90 plus percent of chickens that you eat are like 45, 48 days from chick, hatch chick. Wow. To slaughter. Which is insane, and you they are, they are like they don't have any feathers because they've been selectively bred to like not have any plucking. They can't walk because their muscles get all fibrous because they grow so fast. And if they again, if you don't feed them some of the amino acids and things that are in 
corn and soy because they've, they've been selected with this monocrop system for so long. They'll just die. Wow, that's it wild. Insane. Um, I wonder if you could feed them compost. Pigs, yes. Chickens, less so. Again, oh. because we're like they are very specific. Like chicken nutrition is very complex. Oh, for the breeds that we have. So Cooks Venture is a company that's trying to solve this by growing perennial grains, and also trying to select for breeds that aren't as crazy like this. Mm-hmm. Talking to the CEO there, trying to get him to look at low PUFA because like if any grains are going to have high amount of linoleic acid in them, like these animals shouldn't be eating grains. Mm-hmm. More, far better and a step in the right direction for sure but i'd say like they're the ones who are doing it the best of anybody cool but yeah there's a lot wow. to like pigs pigs you can feed anything yeah. but then again you talk about regenerative and i'm sure you and robbie will get into this you should ask him about pigs he's he knows way more about the stuff than i do but pigs root up the ground that's how they that's why wild boars here we don't like them it's because they destroy cropland and they destroy any type of land and they destroy the soil and the root structures and everything and so some people put rings in their nose so they don't root anymore but then the species appropriate behavior is disappears and then they can't access food and then you have to feed them even more it's like all these weird things about agriculture wow. like we've normalized this stuff but wow. yeah, yeah i mean chicken pork are huge amounts of linoleic acid nuts which people overdo 100 percent on a ketogenic diet the oils obviously it's like the oils are so pervasive in our culture and what we eat it is shocking. Like, I legitimately couldn't go to several restaurants here and ask them. They could not give me one option that didn't have vegetable in it. It's everywhere. In every food you eat out, out in a restaurant, unless you ask, there are some that do a really good job of this. Um, Dai Due, if you've been there, it's my favorite restaurant in Austin. It's like they use, I think, rice bran in their fryer. Most days on Sunday, they use, they use tallow. They can't make it happen anyway, like anywhere else. They were going to stop doing fried food. And people got so pissed that they were losing customers left and right. And so they needed to give them a fried food option, but they, they can't sustain the prices of using things like tallow in the fryer. And so this is a conundrum for restaurant owners where like, I understand it's the cheapest option. It's flavorless. They're taught in culinary school. Use these things. It's the best. It lowers LDL. And there's a reason for this. So when you have, like one of the main arguments for vegetable oils and using them in cooking, well, they lower LDL. And LDL is thought to be a bad thing. You want to know why they lower LDL? It's because they turn LDL into oxidized LDL. Wow. And oxidized LDL is actually what leads to heart disease. Wow. And the, you legitimately, like by definition, cannot have oxidized LDL without eating vegetable oils and having this sort of inflammatory process in your body. Damn, bro. <laughs> What are we gonna do? The world's so complicated. Yeah, I mean, this is like this is what keeps me up at night. These what are about? Like, uh, okay, so, so this is, it's your answer about what is keto? No, that's yeah, that's <laughs> good. Cool. We're three and a half hours in. Um, for those listening, before I forget, you can go to perfectketo.com and you can enter the code Lifestylist twenty for twenty percent off. About what I'm going to talk uh, to <laughs> here, because like I said, when I found you, I was experimenting with ketosis and trying i couldn't really do it and then i found these ketone products and so a lot of people now are finding that for athletic performance brain function etc for me it just makes it super easy to fast like i love taking your Mm -hmm. keto powders little chocolate ones and berry flavor and whatever and i just stir them up in water and they actually don't taste disgusting like some other ketone salts and esters that i've tried that are not very palatable and also give you the runs um but you guys seem to make like a good tasting line of keto products. So to, I know you're not like a huge promo guy and I appreciate your classiness around that. Like you came in, you're like, I don't even care if we talk about my stuff. I'm like, okay, well, I want to talk about it because I like it. Um, but what's the deal with taking exogenous ketones? We kind of get the diet part down. Yeah. Uh, what are these? How are they made? What are the different types? What do they do for you? Yeah. So the, again, when you restrict carbohydrates, your body takes fat, starts putting into ketones. You can also supplementally take ketones and they enter your cells in the same way. And so there's a metabolic shift that needs to happen. And I think that it can be a good thing to bridge people for the first time. So again, like if, if you've never been in ketosis before and you restrict carbohydrates, your body will go, where the hell is all the energy? I need energy. And then you get this crash, this keto flu. You dump electrolytes and also you just don't have any energy availability for any of your cells, especially your brain. So you feel like crap. Once you sort of get over that hump, again, or like, two to 18 weeks, just depending on the person, that cycle doesn't happen anymore. So it doesn't need to be the case for like, there's different use cases. One is somebody who's getting into keto- ketosis for the first time. It's excellent. People are fasting. But the question is, 
what's the goal of fasting? It's like, okay, well, if you're consuming something, some people are fasting purists where they think any intake of anything, even electrolytes or bone broth or any of this stuff is like, you will break the fast. Well, this question is like, what will break the fast? It's like, why, why are you fasting? There's a lot of different physiological effects of fasting. So if you're doing it for weight loss or hunger suppression, or some, some of these other things, focus, it's totally fine. If you're doing it because you're trying to increase autophagy for cancer, it's like, well, fasting is probably not as good, but the ketones will actually, there's been a lot of research around this. Tom Seyfried is a phenomenal researcher who deals with all this stuff. Ketones will actually fight the cancer probably more than the fasting without the ketones will. Now, I'm not claiming that these products will cure cancer, just to be very, very clear, but they have been shown to assist. Um, Dom D'Agostino has done a lot of great work here as well. Uh, and then also just like mental performance. This is why I take them mostly. Like I took them before this podcast. And there's sometimes like my fiance and I are dealing with this mold problem at our house right now. Crazy brain fog. I woke up today, insane headache. Couldn't think. Like can't recall memory. It's just awful. And I take these these um, ketones and just sort of cuts through the fog. And times like that, like I want to be top notch all the time. Obviously, life happens to people, and there's there's moments when it's not the case. But when you're adding basically another energy source and a fuel source, especially the brain, they cross the blood brain barrier with all the work that it takes for carbohydrates to be broken down and then metabolized into glucose into the brain. Oh, wow. Yeah. Really? So when you take exogenous ketones, like if I take my perfect keto powder, put in some water, pound that down, it doesn't have to be broken down and then turned into energy. Yeah, like those ketones in, are already straight ketone in the, energy. Oh, that's wild. I didn't know that. Juiced up right away. And like, this is why I think that there should be a, a drink on the sideline of every sports game that has whatever, keep carbohydrates in it. Like I don't, again, I'm like, I'm not a carbohydrate hater. I mean, they're totally fine in the right settings and the right people. I think if you're a pro athlete, you shouldn't have to fear carbohydrates. But add ketones in there because if you get brain trauma, your brain starts to swell. You actually can't metabolize and break down carbohydrates, glucose for energy. And so this lack of energy causes hypoxia in the brain and it causes all these problems. Like, so most of the problems in uh, traumatic brain injury, concussions, things like that, cause from lack of energy source. So if you actually are consuming ketones while you're having a, a concussive High, high risk for concussion sport, you're, you're dramatically reducing the risk for any sort of brain damage moving forward. It's like th these are some of the things like the future of like sort of like where the keto industry is at, like hopefully we'll go there. Uh, Dom again has done really great research here. There's a, I think it's the University of Alabama is doing a study right now, giving half of their players ketones like in a Gatorade like formula and the other not. And so we'll see like after a year or two like, what. What the implications of that are in humans? We've shown this multiple times in lab it, it, with with um, it's called a neuron scratch test, where they cut a neuron, and one was supplied with glucose, one with ketones. The healing was just super fast, incredibly fast with ketones. There was like basically no damage, and there was actually more growth post damage than there was without anything any damage at all. It's wow. Interesting. Um, yeah, so it's it like one of these things where I think we're just starting to realize the utility of these things as a tool. And again, I think like, do we need these from birth? Probably not if you're a HADSA member. But again, like our metabolisms are such where we've never been in a state of ketosis our entire life. So we have this mismatched physiology from what should actually be represented versus what is, is occurring in our environments now. So I think it's like these people are finding a lot of utility in this stuff because they've never had these amounts of ketones. Again, like these Hadza guys are run, running around producing ketones all, all the time. Like it's just a state of being for humans. Right. And how do exogenous ketones uh, assist with athletic performance? You, again, you're, just, uh, you're allowing for more energy in a different type of energy system. And, and because it's faster, yeah. because you don't have to break it down. Yeah. Like if you're a long distance runner and you like carbo load the day before or even right before the race, then still you're not really getting the net effect of that energy as yeah. fast. Yeah, I think, again, when people start uh, accepting carbohydrates more, the, the perf huge performance thing of fueling strategies is going to be like, for everybody's going to have like some ratio of ketones and carbohydrates. And whether it's like 20% ketones, 80% carb, or vice versa for whatever athlete, you're probably going to find some individual variants there. But there's some fringe people who are doing this now and having insane results. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think that's sort of the future of fueling for athletic performance. <laughs> cookie cookie, cookie sees allison out there <laughs> i thought i heard that's my little alarm um and what are the difference between uh ketone esters and ketone salts like when if someone's interested in taking exogenous ketones like we're describing yeah. here 
what are the different types and why do some of them taste horrible and are hard digestively, et cetera? So the ketone salts are just the, the ketone molecule bound to a salt. So it's sodium, calcium, magnesium, potassium, et cetera. The esters are uh, unbound. So you, you're getting them usually in a liquid form. So they have to be suspended in water. And the difference between the two is huge one's price. So the salts are, you know, one to three dollars per serving, depending on where, where you're getting them from. And the esters are about thirty dollars a serving. So for most people, that just sort of eliminates oh, the, damn. the need for them. Um, the esters will increase the amount of ketones in your bloodstream way more, which for like a professional athlete who needs them for an event makes tons of sense. For somebody who's like really trying to take treatment of certain conditions, cancer or whatever, makes a lot of sense. For the average person who just wants some some benefits, I would say not worth the 10x cost. Um, the salt issue with digestive stuff has like mostly been ironed out with the production of it and how it's how it's bound to the salt. And most people don't have that problem anymore. And I think that it's one of these things, again, where if your body has never made ketones in your entire life and you take a shitload of them, your body's going to go, what the hell is this? Get it out immediately. Right. It's not used to this molecule. Um, so this is usually the the problem that people have when they first start getting into ketosis. Like if this is you and you're trying these products, have a fourth scoop, half scoop, whatever, test it out. Otherwise, like you can get some diarrhea. Same thing with MCT oil. Same thing. Your yeah. body doesn't know how to take it up and uptake it in your gut. So it flushes it out. It goes, oh, this is a foreign thing. We should get it out. Okay, good to know. Yeah, I don't find that I really have that problem uh, with the perfect keto stuff. But I thought maybe that was just because I, maybe I was getting used to it. But also, yeah. it's just like some of the other ones that I've tried. I don't know that I've tried the esters, but they just taste a lot stronger. And Intense. I think just even when I'm just drinking it, I'm like, uh, my body's not going to like this. But I, I you know. It, it, it can be intense for sure. Yeah. And I, I do appreciate how this has turned into a perfect keto ad. <laughs> I hope we're paying you well, sir. Inadvert I wish you were. <laughs> Inadvertently. I wish everyone was. Um, all right. Well, I think, man, I think that's pretty much it. You know, I think we we covered what I wanted to. Is just, and I'm sure a lot of people listening even know more about ketosis and all this stuff than I do. But And me too, probably. It's something that's just been around in the periphery for so many years now. I thought, I got to talk to someone about this. It's a thing. And I also... You know, I think it was when I started years ago drinking Bulletproof coffee. Mm -hmm. That's when I first realized that uh, eating is not as important as I thought it was because I just have the MCT oil and grass-fed butter and I'd have my coffee in the morning. I'm like, next thing you know, the first time I'm hungry is five or six at night. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like that now. Like, I just don't really eat during the daytime. But then, and maybe I was like getting acclimated to ketosis, but then when I added uh, exogenous ketones, which I forget to take sometimes because I run out of it fast because I love it and then I use it all and I forget. But when I have the combination of those two, like I have massive amounts of energy and I think very clearly and um, it just feels great. And it also just saves time and energy on having to worry about food all day. Mm -hmm. I'm not like a huge, uh, hugely motivated foodie. It's like, I like a nice dinner, but most of the time during the day, I just want to work and like yeah. keep it moving. I don't want to stop and like, where are we going to eat? It's just, kind of a hassle I'm the same. I'm the same so from that point of view i think the you know the keto life serves me and probably some other people and also you know i mean a lot of people have a lot of success with it losing weight and i know that's yeah. a concern for a lot of people too if you want to lose weight cut out the carbs for sure but must 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 cut out the vegetable oils and i would say even chicken and pork Okay, and, and that's nut, new information. And, and nuts and seeds. Ah, oh, bacon. Ah, oh, come on, man. <laughs> I'm working. I'm working on a solution. So, you are yeah. on a on a healthy bacon. Yes. Okay. Good. Yes, sir. Uh, huh. But yeah, I mean, this is the biggest thing. If you if you want to lose fat, absolutely, and like it, it can take a while, four or five, six weeks, especially before you start changing over some of these fatty acids. Man, it's uh, long. Like it could take up to two years. This is the thing. People don't have right. patience, but. It, Every time you eat vegetable oil, it's going to stay in your cells for a minimum two years. That's so wild. And this leads to the the lipofuscin, right? Like the skin spots and all this kind of stuff? I don't know. I don't know what that means. Oh, well, when people eat a lot of PUFAs and then get a lot of sun, that's mm. where you get these sun spots. It's yeah, this whole sense. other lipofuscin issue that I don't exactly understand yet. But, um, you know, people that eat a ton of seafood and fish oil and these seed oils uh, tend to be very spotty, yeah. which is just an indicator of the underlying lipofuscin uh, issue. Yeah, I don't think people should be eating tons of omega-3 either. Yeah. What's your take on uh, fish oil in general? 
again, used to be all about it. And now just the research that I've done lately is it's like we look at the reasons why it's beneficial or could be beneficial. Like I don't think eating fish is bad other than if you're avoiding heavy metals for sure, but it's just unnecessary. Like we, we look at the ratio of omega three to omega six, say in like the Hadza tribe say, Oh, their ratio is like two to one. It's just like what we should aim for. And so instead of reducing the amount of total omega six, which is polyunsaturated fatty acids, we're talking about the linoleic acid, omega threes which are, are also polyunsaturated fatty acids. We just try to increase those to hit the same ratio. So having total amount of linoleic acid high is still the problem. You're not taking care of the problem. And you're adding even more reactive. Because polyunsaturated fatty acids, basically they have these double bonds in the, the fat molecule that just make them highly oxidized. And so even fish oil, it's like, just eat the fish. Eat the fish. Like the fish need it because they need a slippery membrane because they're, they're in cold water. That's why colder water fish has higher amounts of omega-3. Oh, like, interesting. Humans don't need that unless like we maybe Wim Hof needs it because <laughs> right. he seems to be doing just fine though. Right. Um, but yeah, people, it's like we don't need that type of fatty acid in our tissues. Like plants need it in higher amounts in certain mm-hmm. plants because they need to get certain um, nutrients up and down their, um, their plant walls. But humans don't need that. Okay, cool. So. Good information. Yeah, I mean, we we could go on forever Thanks, with the, the poofa stuff. So no, it's good. It's good That's to cut good. Me off. This is an incredible conversation, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, appreciate it. Much appreciate. It. I'm glad we finally got it done. It was well worth the many year wait. I guess it took us both being landed here in Austin. So thanks for coming out today. Well, thanks for coming to Austin. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. What an incredible journey with our guest, Anthony, into the heart of Tanzania and the Hudson people. It's so fascinating to hear about his journey. And I remember sitting here um, during the interview and just thinking, wow, God, we've really drifted so far, haven't we? That's not to say that I would want to give up my electricity and food on demand and all the things that our modern lifestyle uh, affords us. But it really um, sparked something within me to see that there are at least a few people on earth still living as natural humans. And hopefully, at least they'll be able to remain that way forevermore. Next week's episode, number 375, is uh, one that people have been requesting a lot. It has to do with detox and immunity. And there are certain words I can't say uh, publicly anymore because we live in a in an authoritarian sort of communist media squeeze at the moment. But uh, that aside, Dr. Chris Shade, PhD, is our guest next week. And uh, dude's hella smart. So if you're interested in safe and effective ways to detox the body and build your immunity. Next week's episode will not disappoint. And if by the end of this conversation you became keto curious, remember that Anthony's company has given you guys a great 20% discount over at perfectketo.com. And the code there is the lifestylist 20. And uh, a great way to support this show, you guys, is of course to share it with a friend. So if you were inspired by this conversation like I was, Click on your uh, podcast app there and click share. It should be somewhere in the right, on the top or the bottom. And it'll let you text it or email it to a friend or even take a screenshot and post it on social media. It's a great free non-committal way to support the show. It's great if you guys support the sponsors and buy things, but honestly, just you listening is a huge gift uh, for which I am very grateful. And if you take that step a, a bit further, share it with a couple of friends that's greatly appreciated because this show has really never advertised, actually really never, you know, it has never advertised. It's grown steadily over the past six and a half years or so uh, up to its current, I think close to 8 million downloads. And that's from people like you listening and uh, being inspired to share it with your friends. So thank you so much for tuning in again to one more episode. And I'll be back next week with number 375 featuring Dr. Chris Shade. 